Okay, we're recording. Welcome back. <laughs> Hello, world. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I'm Christina, for anyone just tuning in, uh, and I've got the lovely Julian Vitoni with us today. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. It's been really exciting and interesting for me to reach out to different people in my network. Um, and I mean, eventually, depending on how long I do this, I'm going to keep reaching out to people I've, I haven't worked with before, which is yeah. kind of fun. Yeah. Um, but what has been my usual procedure is at the start, uh, I'd love to ask how you got started. Like maybe what was your first job in camera or your first job in production altogether? Yeah, so I mean, I knew very early on that I wanted to be in the film industry. So right after high school, I went to film school. I was very young. I went to film school for three years and I started to work very quickly. That was back in Paris in France. Um, so I started from really the bottom. Like I didn't know anybody in the film industry in France. So I started as a PA, uh, a location PA, um, mm -hmm. driving the truck, uh, driving the actors, shopping for the craft service and all this stuff. That's, I really started like this and then paid PA and uh, I, I found my way up slowly. Um, I started to be in the AD department. I wanted to very, very much to be director. So I was, uh, I became a second second. Um, I was also um, uh, in charge of like backgrounds on a few uh, TV shows that I did. So I was really touching everything that I could to be on set. Um, but then it's really when I moved to the US about 15 years ago that um, I, uh, I decided to focus on camera. I mean, it's always something I liked a lot and I realized that being like in the AD department was not really what I liked. Uh, it's, it's, about, it's not about directing at all. <laughs> it's about, you know, scheduling and making sure that the directors has everything mm. came to direct. So I was not very happy and I was very, always very interested in cameras. I've always been filming since I was a kid, taking photos. And one of my friends in the, in the LA was the first AC. So he took me on and I started with him on a lot of non-union shows. Do, I was a, a second slash loader. It was this kind of one position for both at the time on like uh, uh, music videos, commercials, and then I did some independent features. Uh, but very quickly, I actually became a first AC within the first year. I, I oh. went, uh, yeah, I became a first AC on non-union projects, a lot of low budget features. Um, and then uh, a couple of years later, I joined the union uh, on a TV show. I had a chance, but I had to go back. So I joined the union as a second AC and my first position was a loader. Um, really? TV show. Yeah. So, you know, it's like I, I went up in the non-union world, but back, back in LA, back in 2007, uh, you really had to go up the ladder, I think. And so uh, no problem going back to being a loader for, uh, for a show. And it was video, actually. It was uh, very early on, like we're shooting F900s. The show was in treatment. And so it was a lot of, uh, I was uh, wrangling cables a lot to the DIT. That was my main job and logging tapes. Yeah. <laughs> but that was my way into the union. Uh, but very quickly, I, I went back to being a first. Hmm. Were you out first. in LA for a while then? Yeah. Yeah. So when I moved from France, I had stayed in LA for five years. Oh, okay. This is, yeah. That was my first stop. I joined the union there. And I stayed for another couple of years and then I eventually relocated to New York. And you've been first thing pretty much since you've been in New York? Yes. Yeah. And New York all the time until I related to operator by a couple of years ago. I did, uh, yeah, 13 years of, as a first in uh, New York. Yeah. New York was as much as I was a little bit struggling in LA to find work because there's a lot of people and it's very big. I felt as soon as I moved to, to New York that I went up one level. Like suddenly, right away, I was on some mm. TV shows. I was on feature with really good actors. I just felt here there was such a potential like, to grow in the camera department. I felt it right away. And everybody was very welcoming and helpful. I really, that's why I was able to, to establish myself in like six months or so, getting my first feature. And, uh, that's so. a great feeling. I mean, I felt that too, actually. It's, it was really, I was almost like surprised. You know, like I was a PA for a while and then, yeah. Once I started getting a camera and specifically once I was in the union, I was honestly kind of surprised how welcoming people were, you know, and they're like, we need more loaders. We need more people oh, like yeah. you, like, you know, and it's really cool to, to meet all these different people on different crews. And yeah, 
I mean, you know, I, I, I knew a few DPs. Fred Murphy was a DP of Intreatment back in LA, so he got me on the, the good fight as a day player. Okay. But I also met some people like Mike Burke for Stacey that I just, you know, reached out to him. He didn't know me. We met for coffee and eventually got me work on some features. I mean, like, there was this kind of, like, I feel like everybody was very um, welcoming and, you know, not threatened by you in any way. And... Uh, I think that was the right move for me to come to New York. It was, it was, retrospectively, that was really a good move, yeah, professionally. Yeah. When, when you were uh, firsting for all those years, did you have like a specific second AC that was like your person for a long time or did you? Yeah, I did. I mean, they, I mean, first AC, they, I had people that in LA that I, I always worked with. Um, I'm thinking right now of Delphina Garth. Yes, that was the second AC that I worked a lot with, uh, especially on, on non-union jobs. Uh, in, uh, in New York, James Schlittenhardt was my I feel like first AC, second AC for a while until he went and just did something else. Uh, and then uh, Carlos Barbo was one of my uh, second ACs. Actually, I met him as a, my PA. And then oh, really? He moved to second AC, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it, it's been, I've been changing. I feel like second AC, they rotate, they go up fast now. So um, it changed. I don't have someone that I worked with all the time. But uh, James is probably the, the one that I use. We had like a little relationship for a while. Uh, if you looked at your whole career up until now, would you say there's any other person on set, whether it's other operators or DPs that you've maybe worked with the longest altogether? Or are those sometimes those connections with you as like a first and second have been maybe your longest? Um, DPs, I mean, you know, I've, I've done three years on the, on power, so the two DPs uh, were really the people I, I stuck with for a while. It was uh, Hernan Antonio and uh, Maurizio Rubinstein. But otherwise, I mean, like, I feel like I never had a real DP that I stuck with the whole way. Like, that was more true in LA when I was yeah. working on smaller uh, uh, features. I, I used to work with the same DPs over and over. I'm thinking of Harris Shar and Ambus. I did a lot of non-union feature with them traveling like in the middle of nowhere. Um, started kind of growing together. He was a young DP and I was a, a new first AC. So yeah, that was the kind of the old fashioned way of kind of, you know, you're with someone, he takes you on every job and, and that's how he was. But today I, I can't say I have someone that I'm, I'm his, first I'm not a first AC anymore. <laughs> I'm an operator, but I feel like I don't have that relationship yet. And I kind of miss it sometimes. I wish, I wish. Um, but I can say that right now there's two people that are, I cherish a little bit more. It's Liran Kahanov and Jimmy Silverstein, both from uh, Madam Secretary. They've been super helpful to help me as an operator, really. They give me the time, they give me their support and trust. And yeah. I, I'm very grateful. I like to work with it. <laughs> yeah, it is a really fun feeling when you get to say like, oh, I, I just spent 16 hours a day and I'm working with my friends or like working with people I really like to work with. You yeah. know, that kind of helps you get motivated to go back and do <laughs> another yeah, crazy day. And I think as much as I, I think I was a bit burnt out as a first AC after 13 years, I was working a lot. Um, almost all year long. I was I've, as an operator. I can appreciate that more. You know, mm -hmm. I, I've been day playing a lot. Like last year, it was only day playing. Oh, really? I kept busy, yeah. But I, every day was a joy to go to work. Yeah. Has it really? You've really felt the difference between being a focus puller versus being an operator, like in more just sure life. Yeah. yeah, I think you know the workload. I think is not the same. First day, see a uh, mm -hmm. camera system in general. I feel like it's more intense from the beginning and loading the gear and going on set and the whole day and then wrapping it up. It's, 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 it's long. And when you're on the show for six months, yeah, it takes a lot of uh, toll on you. As an operator, it's different. You know, you have a more relaxed kind of uh, schedule, especially when you're a day player. You work, what, two days a week, three days. So when you come to work, you're always in a big smile on your face because, you know, it's one day you're, and it's great. Um, and you don't have to wrap up at the end, but the pressure is different. I mean, obviously you have a lot more pressure as, you know, being the operator, the pressure from the director, the actors there. It's a different dynamic, 
but I love it. I love it. Well, that's uh, another aspect of this interview series that I've been really fortunate and maybe grateful to be asking people because kind of while you're in it, you know, when we were on set, when we're working all the time. You we don't have time to chat. You don't have time to chat or it's just like you're just in it so much that you're like, okay, I, you know, especially, you know, if you're just being a camera assistant where I am, you know, you're like, okay, I have to get this or the batteries have to be here, you know, but it has been really um, exciting for me to learn more about how people are balancing themselves just as people too. You know, like when you're on set, maybe you're asking them more questions, maybe a little bit like, how's your family? Right. <laughs> you know, but like, <laughs> I guess that's the, the kind of the, the next wave of where we're at now is how people are refiguring out what their work-life balance is, like what their priorities are. You know, like, I feel like that's something that, I'm curious how it's been for you in this sense of like pre-COVID versus post-COVID. So like when you were working all the time the past, say, 10 years, 15 years, were there little things that you did that really helped you like stay sane or stay connected to your people in your life? To my people outside of work? Or, um, you yeah, know, no, I think that was my issue is I was having a hard time to, to find a balance. Um, I was... I really believed in hard work and, you know, climbing the ladder and um, I was, I've been pretty successful, especially in New York in terms of being a first AC. So I was taking a lot of work, a lot of work and I was happy. I became comfortable with it and I enjoyed it. But at some point I, I realized that my life didn't make sense. I like, I was not able to enjoy my private life. I was burned out, uh, tired chronically. Um, this is when I started to have this, um, I told you, some migrants that, you know, my body was telling me, you need to slow down. You need to slow down. And um, yeah, I think that's also what pushed me to transition to operator at some point. Yeah. Because I wanted to do it for a while, but every time there was another project as a first, I was like, okay, this is the last one. And then yeah. There was another one, this is the last one. And uh, after a while, I also wanted to have a better work-life balance, and I think being an operator would give me that as well. Hmm. Um, so, I mean, my first year as an operator, I had a lot of free time, you know. So, <laughs> I was definitely able to to enjoy myself privately better, have better relationships, a better kind of healthy lifestyle, working out, meditating. I've done a lot of things to address the, this kind of stress that I was having chronically from working a lot, being overworked. Um, and because it does impact your, your work. You know, if your body's stressed, if you're stressed, if you're tired, then you're not as good at your work. And as an operator, I noticed, you see it right away. Like, you know, if you're tired, you're stressed, your framing will show. Like, I oh, really? Run, for example, uh, the first times I was operating, I was kind of stressed. I was also having a lot of migraines at the time, and it was kind of a difficult time for me. But he was able to tell me, it's like, it, was, it came to me after a, a take, it was like, breathe, relax, everything's good, you know? Because he could see that I was tense just by holding the camera. Mm. So I realized that I really needed to take care of my body. And that's part of the work as technicians. We need to take care of our tool to do better work. Um, better job so overall I feel today especially with COVID I, I am more relaxed I'm more balanced um, yeah I'm a bit more mature in a way to, to, because I, I think this uh, life work and life balance is very important to me I, I will not compromise too much about it anymore I'm, I'm, I'm in my 40s <laughs> I, I do appreciate the value of uh, health so and that's why I get involved with the union more to try to yeah. like, yeah, you know, like you realize you work 14 hours a day, every day, which I've, I've done. I was like, you need to do something about it because I love my work, but I'm starting to like not be able to do it or I'm going to have to choose. Yeah. Um, so that's why I started to attend more meetings and trying to, I'm very, I'm a proponent of less work and more rest or 12 on 12 off or something that's more livable so we can do this job and enjoy it and also have a life on the side. Yeah. So yeah, maybe COVID will do that. You know, now I hear maybe. shorter hours. I don't know. Let's see. Yeah, I mean, it's been so interesting to talk to people that are in different places in their career and say the same thing, you know, like I think a lot of people in the film industry feel really passionate about it. 
And then yeah. there's that aspect of, you know, we all hope to be passionate about the jobs that we do, but then there's the aspect where it, then you kind of get addicted to it or you can't balance other things because you're so used to like, oh, getting that paycheck. Oh, like I need to work 16 hours. Like I can't, you know, like I have to be there. Uh, <laughs> so it's right. been, yeah, like I feel like it's really been like a reality check. You yeah. hope it's a reality check. <laughs> and there's also this idea that, and especially maybe in the camera department, but you have to suffer kind of through it. There's this kind of like you have to suffer your way through. You know, if you, if you don't work, if, you don't in, if you're not in pain, you're not working hard enough. There's this kind of idea. Yeah. Um, when I was a very young PA back in France, I remember it all my life. I was a very unpaid PA and I was, I guess I had a little free time and I sat, I sat down. And the director came to me and says, you know, uh, a sad PA is a dead PA. <gasps> That's what she told me. And that st stuck with me for, for most of my career. Like, if, you know, if you're comfortable, it's not right. <laughs> so for like 10 years, I never sat. <laughs> I, I was never sitting. I was always standing for hours, for days on out. Even as a focus puller, I was always standing. It's only the last three, four years that I took a sit. <laughs> I actually got a stool that I was carrying on my car just to sit where I could. And I was like, why do I have to be uncomfortable? all day. I, I need to do a job that's really complicated and precise. I want to be comfortable. So now I was having my, my, my stool up with me and my monitor. But you know, some people didn't like it. And it's always this idea that if you're comfortable, it's not okay. But I, maybe COVID made us realize that. So now, you know, we need to, we can, I think it's possible to have, to work in the right conditions. I think it's totally possible to do. It's just a matter of, um, changing our old habits and COVID is doing that for us. We're forcing us to do that. It's forcing us. <laughs> That's yeah. a good point. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I'm curious when you used to work all the time, going back to back to back to back jobs, did you in your free time ever watch any movies or TV shows or did you kind of like keep it separate in a way? To be honest, like, no. Yeah. When I was working, I was never watching it very little. I, I, I don't really go to the movies anymore. Like, I don't, like, not right now, but in general, I don't really go to the movies. Yeah. Um, when I was younger in France, I, I used to go, like, three or four times a week yeah. to see movies. It was, like, my, I was eating from it, like, it was my food. But no, I guess not. I was, you don't have time. I mean, when? <laughs> you sleep when you can. Um, but, you know, I've been catching up lately, like, I'm watching some old movies that I've never got a time to see, and definitely watching a lot of documentaries and stuff yeah i've been TV. watching a lot of documentaries i spend a lot of time doing that i actually you know sometime in the middle of the day or something in the morning i'll get up get my breakfast next thing i'll do is watching the movie it is like a really like bizarre like luxurious time you know it it's is. Like, i guess while the world's burning outside i'll have my cup of coffee and watch documentary you know yeah and it was kind of nice you have nothing else to do why not but i feel like it's almost the end of this like as i hear that things are gearing up you know, I can start hearing that some projects are starting again. So take it while you can, I think. Go yeah. for it. Yeah. Are there certain movies that are kind of like your go-tos that you could kind of always watch or rewatch? Um, hmm. So you see, like, this is where you get me when I have to quote something. One. Um, <laughs> no, I've been rewatching some movie with my boyfriend recently because he doesn't have a... Uh, he hasn't watched a lot of movies, so we've been watching some classics recently. Uh, Memento. Uh, yesterday we watched uh, uh, Spirited Away from Miyazaki. Okay. So, and we've been a lot of uh, watching a lot of crime shows recently. Oh yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's just very trendy right now. I feel like there's so many of these shows. So yeah. yeah. It's, you know, it's funny. I actually. I'll go in waves where I'll like watch a lot of like true crime stuff. True crimes, yeah. Like violent stuff. And then I'm like, okay, I got to really mellow it out. Like <laughs> watch something really easy or like just, you know, that kind of like popcorn stuff you could have in the background and do. Yeah, know? definitely. It's sometimes you want something light. I, I, yeah. I agree to, to balance it out. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, maybe it's name dropping here and maybe it's hard off the top of your head, but are there certain cinematographers that you've either worked with or you haven't worked with that you really admire or you're like, oh, I love their work. Oh God, this is going to have edits. I'm bad at names. <laughs> you know, I am more, I'm more sensitive to photographers. It's something that for me speaks to me more. Like visually, I'm more of a, 
as an operator even I, I'm very sensitive to some photographers like uh, Irving Penn for example I don't know if you know him Irving Penn was a photographer oh, Irving Penn yeah yeah I'm a big fan of his work um, because he he was able to have this kind of documentary kind of um, um, look mm. he was photographing real people in real life but in a kind of studio setting a little bit like uh, um, of mise-en-scene, you know, and uh, I remember he, had, he has a great series about um, people in France. He went to Paris, because this is what he used to do. He would go to Paris, to a place, set yeah. a camp for a month or two. He was always having the same backdrop, it was kind of a leather backdrop, okay. and he would, he would photograph people from where he was. And uh, he did a series in the 50s uh, in Paris. He was um, oh, no, no, no. photographed all these sort of people, firemen, postmen, uh, bakers. And I just found them very, very aesthetically touching. Yeah. And also, there's another photographer I like. He's French. His name is uh, Raymond de Pardon. Okay. And I'm saying it with an English accent, as you can see. So, <laughs> yeah. But he is a kind of documentary style photographer, real people. Um, and you, you, what he's really able to capture something genuine about the people he photographs, like, you know, and that's what I, I like about it. I, I'm a, more of a documentary style kind of, kind of guy. Like, this yeah. is what really touches me. But I think you can apply that even in scripted TV or scripted shows, this kind of uh, authentic kind of mm. look. Yeah. Are there some documentaries that you've watched during quarantine or just like in your life that have really like stunned you? Um, damn, I actually have asked you before for some questions. And <laughs> <laughs> documentaries. Um, I don't know. I don't know on top of my head. Okay. No worries. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> you know, I, I have found it really exciting to hear more about people's like kind of overall artistic inspirations because I feel like sometimes it's like I don't know if it's just like this it's like almost like hyper simplified answer but it's like you know when someone asks a director like what directors do you like and it's like it's as if it's like all in the same plane like I'm only mm -hmm. inspired by people that do the same thing as me and I've noticed it's really cool when camera operators and cinematographers and other photographers reference painters or different sculpture artists you know like it's that kind of stuff is really interesting to me um so like when you talk about still photographers i think maybe people wouldn't like assume that you know like we work in moving pictures so like why would you look at still pictures you know but i've actually i've heard a lot of operators mention that especially when it comes like framing oh yeah i love going to museum and just um you know wander around yeah it's uh it's one of my favorite as an operator i think it's um you know that this is one frame basically this is just one frame and but sometimes they, you can see the the, the finesse of the, their work and the light and everything uh, yeah this is what i'm more um enriched by as an operator and as a photographer i take photos too but i'm a very much like as a photographer i love portrait i love to connect with my subjects i'm always trying to get some sort of uh emotion out of it trying to yeah. to know them really i do I, I do portraits. This is my kind of hobby on the side. What camera do you shoot on? Sorry? What camera do you shoot on? Oh, um, right now I have a Fuji X X20, XT20. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's like a mirrorless. Yeah. I was, I was a Nikon for my whole life. I changed like a couple Ooh. years ago. Yeah, I wanted to do something smaller, like same like documentary style. I don't want something big and mm. clumsy. I just like, I like something small. And yeah. Fuji is actually really good. They have very nice glass. But I'm not a really geeky guy with cameras. Yeah. No. <laughs> I know. Like, how many camera systems do you know who are, like, geeking out or, like, oh, I got a little Fuji on me today or, like, you know, I got this on me. Like, <laughs> I've never been a, a technical person. Like, I know how a camera works. I know, you know, everything that you need to know as a camera system. But I'm not, you know, this is not... A, criteria for me to choose or it's not something yeah. I enjoy doing it's, it's just a tool so I'm not the, the most uh, technical person I think I'm not very I mean I'm technical enough to be able to use everything but that's it yeah well when it comes to operating have you found that just maybe like taps into this other part of you like other skill sets you have to maybe be more intuitive or more like physical with your work 
Yeah, that was that. That was a little bit my struggle in my transition. It's like I I have a little bit of um, a lack of confidence in myself, and I always felt like, okay, am I worth worthy of being an operator now? You know, like I had this little imposter syndrome. I felt when I transitioned, even though I've been in the film industry for like twenty five years, I still thought that I was not necessarily ready to be an operator. And I was afraid that, you know, people will see through. <laughs> but it's actually, you, you have to trust your instinct. I think for me, it's knowing that your instinct is worth it. Whatever you think is good, is good because it's, you feel it. You have to trust yeah. that feeling you have because it comes from your years of training, years of being exposed to other uh, DPs, operators, watching movies. You have that in you and you have to just trust yourself to to put it into action as an operator. So, and even as a first AC actually, like I always feel like I rely a lot on my instincts now in terms of what I feel is good, what feels better. Um, this is what I had that I really enjoy as a first AC when I started to really understand when it was not about just keeping it sharp, but it was also just a feeling of when to pull focus, where to pull it, or, you know, that's something very instinctive, very organic and, and, um, that's where I started to really enjoy pulling focus. It's when you were in the scene with the actors and just, if your eye goes a certain way, he wants to see something, do not hesitate, go right away because it's the right instinct. If you as a spectator, you want to, you're attracted to that action, that actor, then the audience will be too. Yeah. So I, I try to do the same thing as an operator, is to follow that instinct. But you have also a lot of things. You 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 have the actors that you you have you know you have to make sure that the DP you're getting what the DP wants and it's very important to you also you're in the middle. So it's you, but it's also you're you're serving other people. So it's finding that balance. That's uh, tricky, but that's that's the pleasure I think of working with other people and collaborating. Yeah, I have to say it's been pretty cool when you like now when I'm not working to kind of like think about all the people that I work with, like say it's like watching Power or watching Ray Donovan or something. And those moments when you just like really acknowledge, like you almost kind of get outside of yourself and you're like, oh, that was a really cool choice. Like I can yeah. see if they did something kind of fun there, you know, like when more like when you kind of uh, maybe you're not thinking so critically and it's just all like, oh, cool, it's sharp. Like, yeah. so cool, they, they move from point A to point B. But when you take that moment, you're like, oh, I see what they did there. Like, that's kind of cool. <laughs> Those are fun moments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you know, I would love to, while we're recording, to ask you about uh, the Local 600 Queer Group. Oh, yes. For many people that don't know about it. And I mean, I, I honestly didn't know much about labor politics or unions before I joined the the camera union here in New York yeah. City, but uh, maybe for people at home that don't know about it, you can. Uh, yeah, I mean, I started about a little bit over a year ago. I I was inspired by the women's committee. I, you know, I started to do some some outreach and trying to promote diversity in terms of uh, having more women on set. And I was like, there's nothing like that for queer people. And I was, I kept seeing queer people on set, but we didn't have a, necessarily a space to connect. As you said, we don't have much time to, to talk on set. So I felt that there would be, there, there was a need maybe for, for something like that. And so I just, you know, started, we, we started by having some meet and greet and to see who would show up, what people would expect. Um, and we had a nice turnout. Uh, and, the queer group, I think, goal is, is, for me, at least it's a social group. I want people to meet up, to talk, to share. I think it's important for people um, um, that we may feel isolated at times if you're queer on set, and uh, I've experienced it. I know it is. Even if it's better today, there's still, like, that feeling you can yeah. not feel free to be yourself, you know, talk about you, because, you know, who knows what, how people will take it. Yeah. But that space uh, for our members, um, I think, is a real need. And so I see it as a social, uh, social venue, you know, just to share and also to bring more allies, to maybe educate people about what's being queer, how to make it more, um, you know, diverse and balanced on set. 
So I just did that on the side, but eventually I, I, want, I really wanted to make it a real part of our union. I wanted it to be an official thing. I don't, I don't want to be on the side um, doing my little group. So back in October, uh, the Quibble became kind of the subcommittee of the diversity committee in the oh, awesome. union. Yeah, so I think it's important for us that to, to know that we have a union that supports diversity. And that's by this kind of uh, action that uh, we're trying to, to change things. You know, that's what we have to do. Uh, that's where I realized that if we're in the union, you want to be, if you want things to change, you have to do it yourself. Kind of like, uh, um, and take a leap and see if it's, um, it's going to work. But yeah, we had a few events. I think the best event we had was the screening we had last December, short film screening where we had like 80 people showed up um, to just, you know, showcase work from our fellow members, queer or not, but we have a lot of talents in our union, uh, assistants like you that want to be DP, they are shooting on weekends, and we don't have time to support each other, to see what other people are doing, so, yeah. you know, that's what I did, and I feel everybody liked it, and honestly, some very talented people uh, we have, so, hopefully we'll be able to do more. Um, we're trying to work on the diversity kind of uh, Zoom meeting, maybe, trying to address diversity uh, in the union. We'll see if it takes. <laughs> yeah, I have to say, I feel oh, like... But yeah, it's, uh, it's, everybody's welcome in that group. I really want to say it's, it's, it's a great group for everybody in the union who is interested yeah. in diversity. Uh, we have a Facebook page, it's the queer group. We have an Instagram, it's the queer group, local sister for queer. So yeah, everybody's welcome to join. That's awesome. You know, uh, I mean, I think when I first joined, I only knew of like the women's group and then yeah. when I say that was three or four years ago, I remember even then they were saying how there's so many unions like Local 52 or like other, you know, other parts of the, even the 600 that don't have women's committees. So it's like, even just like one part of it, you know, like are these diversity committees that weren't really that diverse, you know, like people that say like, I care about the issues, but they don't actually represent people from diverse <laughs> underrepresented communities. So mm -hmm. to have more, uh, groups or subcommittees uh, or just more committees in general of people that actually represent the issues and yeah. really want to put that effort in themselves. Like it means a lot, you know, it's like exciting yeah. to be. I think it will it can empower people to be more involved too because otherwise if the union doesn't represent you very well, you're less likely to want to do anything about it. Exactly. Um, so I think it, it's good. Yeah, we need it. Um, yeah, I'm pretty happy about it. I'm glad that it exists. Hopefully we can keep going. I mean, yeah, yeah. but I feel, you know, definitely um, me on the personal level, like coming out at work was a big thing. Like for the first 10 years of my career, I didn't come out as gay at work because it's something I didn't feel comfortable doing mm -hmm. either because I felt people, I, I may lose work. I don't know, maybe people may not feel comfortable working with me if I was coming out as gay in an overly masculine kind of camera department. Like yeah. me, when I was a, a loader, it was 100% male, you know? And, you know, there's a lot of like not knowing and a lot of jokes that could sometimes land the wrong way. So for a long time, I was not able to come out. And I do think it made, it, it did impact my, my career because I was definitely more reserved as, you know, I couldn't connect with these people because I couldn't be myself. And therefore, a lot of people saw me as a little distant, a little cold, a little French on top of it, yes. <laughs> uh, but since I came out, I was able to be more myself. And I think it definitely improved my um, relationship at work, like with my colleagues, because, you know, you're not afraid to say I have a boyfriend or, you know, um, and you realize there's other people around you that are exactly the same. You know, so it's, you have to start somewhere. So, um, yeah, coming out was a very good thing professionally too. But we need to make sure that everybody can do it. And I've been talking to other uh, members and I still hear like some people saying, I don't feel like supported. I don't feel like I've been like, you know, uh, discriminated against at work or um, people laughing, you know. Queer discrimination can be very, it's not obvious. Mm. It can be in a little jokes here and there. It could be maybe, yeah. I don't know. It's something that you can feel a lot as a queer person, but it's, it's hard to prove necessarily. It's hard to, you know, like uh, for men and women uh, in the camera department, it's pretty obvious. You can see for your eyes the, the, the difference, but 
in terms of um, gender identity, it's more and more difficult. But um, what I realize is people suffer from it too. And you know, I was not so aware that I was not the only one. It's crazy, but I, I realized um, even today, I talked to someone this week about it and he told me like, it's still like an issue for him. And that's why he doesn't like the union. So you see how that kind of snowball. So we need to make sure that uh, the union is diverse and welcome, welcoming for everyone. That's important. I really appreciate you saying that because I feel like maybe people can relate to that outside of the film industry. You know, there's a lot of times when yes. you're, you're in a certain job and, you know, like how many very uh, cisgender normative people are like talking about their husband and wives, their kids, and you're like, I, I don't want to say what I have. Like, just exactly. like, yeah, I love your kids too. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of people don't realize that what that rep repression does to you. Yeah. And you know, uh, I, I remember uh, at some point, someone were asked, some people were asking me about my girlfriend. I was never saying anything because I just didn't want to get into it. But yeah. now I was, if they ask me about my girlfriend, I say, oh, you talk, I have a boyfriend. You know, like it's affirmation. It's, it's, it seems easy, but it's not. But once you get that confidence, that, that comfort, that you can do it in a safe space, that you will be supported in the camera department, and I think we do have that support, especially in younger generation, um, it's, it's for the best, yeah. Um, I worked also in reality TV a little bit, on and off. I always been like on and off reality TV when work is slow, or even as a new operator, that was actually a great way for me to get more experience. Oh yeah? Because there, they're you know easier to they need more cameras, to, <laughs> cameras so they need a lot of operators but i always felt the reality tv camera department being very open very diverse definitely definitely more, more forward almost than uh, the classic uh, scripted world you yeah. see a lot of like black gay queer whatever it's definitely more welcoming um so actually it's some of my friends from that that world that you know give me the the courage to come out in the beginning. That's, I came out first in reality TV. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> that's awesome though. Yeah. yeah, well I really appreciate your time. I feel like it's really important for people to hear stories like that and just like recognize it's not these maybe altruistic, bigger than life, like icons all the time, you know, like these like the first of this or the first of that. It's like all these amazing people along the way that make other people feel more safe or empowered you know like there's a lot of people within uh either the women's committee or the diversity committees queer like whether it's a committee or not that have been paving the way you know like this isn't yeah. new but to to hear more about that experience i i mean it's empowering to me but i imagine a lot of other people will really appreciate it as well mm -hmm. yeah i think we have a lot of the younger generation i think this is the future of our union all these committees people part of those committees are really um the the new blood for the, the yeah. <laughs> too political, I don't know. <laughs> but I really I want I want to see more more young people. You have a lot of young people that for some reason they're a little bit um, disengaged from the union. And I think a way to get them back in is through those communities where they can actually it it, it talks to them more. Yeah. Than just talking about politics, about you know agreements and this and that. Okay. Sometimes we have to connect with your peer. You know, we're all freelancers, so we can be very quickly isolated because you know we we work with different people and we struggle on our own to find work sometimes. And we need to have that space where we can connect and realize, oh, there are people like me. I have, I have a group, I have a little tribe here. And in this way, that could create more work, more inclusion. This is just uh, all good stuff. All good stuff. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I wish we could just be like normal people getting coffee or cocktails or something like out, but yeah. I really appreciate being able to see you today like this. Thank you. No, thank you for doing this. I feel like everybody doing this kind of trying to get member closer to talk to each other. It's, it's, it's great. So when I saw your, your uh, initiative, I was like, that's really cool. I'm glad you're doing it. Keep doing it. Appreciate it. Thanks. I'll try. <laughs> okay. I'll talk to you later. Thank <laughs> you.